I'm your host, Chris Werner. Welcome to Craft and Cocktails, powered by Limelight Wired. This week, we're sitting down with lighting designer and lighting director, Michael Berger. Mike's long resume includes Encore, America's Got Talent, and the Boston Pops Fireworks Spectacular. If you don't have a cocktail yet, grab one. Here we go. Mike Berger. Welcome. Hi. What Hello are you there? there? Uh, I, I'm making it, or I made a cucumber mint gimlet, which is apparently a fancier version of the gimlet. It's got some cucumber, mint, simple syrup, and gin and lime in it. And it is, as you can see, very tasty. Right on. Uh, Rock and a Negroni. Gin, Campari, vermouth. Very nice. Let's talk about, let's talk about you. Where are you from? How did you find yourself in entertainment? Tell us a bit about the uh, Young Mike story. Sure. So I, uh, I grew up outside of Boston, a small town called Needham. No one's actually from Boston. They, they will tell you that they are, but they're not. Um, 20 minutes uh, outside of the city. I got into lighting very young, like oddly young. Uh, when I was nine or 10, I started a mobile DJ business and was kind of servicing a niche market that didn't exist, like six-year-old birthday parties and things of that that nature. <laughs> Weddings, bar mitzvahs, you know, the whole thing. Um, I did that for a couple of years and as, as I started to get older, I found I was more interested in what the lighting gear was doing than the music or kind of keeping the party going. So when I got to middle school, I began to look for ways that I could do just that part of the job and fell into theater. And that was kind of where where it really hit me that, oh, this this could be a, you know, a hobby. At that point, I didn't really know that it could be a career. Um, it's like, this is a hobby. This is a thing I can do instead of sports. So I did that for all of middle school and into high school. And once I was in high school, I realized that, you know, it, it could be career driven. And, I've asked and you that, for years and you've never told me, but can we get the DJ name or DJ name is still out? DJ name, no, it's still out. It's still, it's okay. still out. Yep. Understood. <laughs> so, so then what? What took you from, uh, I know you went to Carnegie Mellon, as I did in Pittsburgh. Um, yeah. How did you end up choosing that location? Uh, I went to the USITT trade show with my dad uh, in high school for a couple years. And we, we had kind of two different purposes for going. His, his desire was to go and to see if I could make a functional career out of this for myself, uh, which, you know, is, is fair. Uh, he didn't really share that tidbit of information with me, but that, that was his, uh, his ulterior motive. Um, I, I had a, a bunch of mentors growing up. I went to a, an overnight camp in Maine, not a theater camp, but there was a pretty strong theater program. And the the folks that were there pushed me towards a lot of liberal arts schools and, you know, that had strong theater programs. And, and in that search, uh, with some help from some, some folks in my high school's guidance department, they we, we kind of unearthed Carnegie Mellon as this like reach school opportunity. Uh, and that, that became where I landed for a variety of reasons, and it, it wound up really being the right fit. Was lighting the focus from, from the start? Did you start with lighting? Uh, at, at school? Yes, at Carnegie Mellon. Oh, no. Um, in fact, it was it's kind of anecdotally a little funny. When when I went for my interview, you know, I'm like, do 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 big fish, small pond in my high school. And I, I went and sat down with the, the head of the department and like, you know, they do the little like free interview thing and they're like, well, do you have any questions? I was like, yes, I'd like to know when I get to design a musical theater. Um, Cause I have no idea. Like, <laughs> I don't know how this works. And they're Fair like, question. well, you know, you know, possibly by your junior year, you would, you would design a show. I'm like, no, no, no. But like, like next year I would design a, a show, of course. Right. <laughs> so nothing the, changes. The, Frankly, my first day through the door was kind of the same question. But as, as I don't know if it was the case when you were there, but when we were there, certainly the, the, the program for the first year and a half is very well-rounded. Um, all aspects of design, all aspects of management. And it's, you know, I, I really support that conceptually. I think it works well. Um, not necessarily, it, it does two things, in, in my opinion. On the one hand, it allows you to really understand that what you think you want to do is what you want to do. I mean, we had 24 people in our class and I think 12 of them changed their direction in the first year. Um, the second piece is that it gives you a greater than a baseline understanding of what the other people on your, you know, in, in your vicinity on a project are doing. So not necessarily like I now understand scenic design, 
but I understand conceptually when I might give a note or a request to a scene designer to change the color of something in tech, like what that actually means. <laughs> My first boss told me that you've got to know what you're asking for. If you're going to ask a big favor or a big task on a project, you've got to know just how big it is, what it takes to do it. Yeah. I don't know how to do it, but I can ask for it. No, exactly. <laughs> so we're hoping to talk to you about television lighting. So um, there's a big gap. Can you fill in some of the, the time in between Carnegie Mellon and, uh, and how you got into television? Definitely. So I did not really want to do television, frankly, when I first started. I had this kind of misconception that all TV lighting was like broadcast news. Um, and when I say that, I mean like just, yeah, yeah, exactly. Just piles of like nice white soft light and some backlight and just, you know, exposure, which it is, I, I'm not trying to belittle the people that like broadcast news. Like there is a challenge in that as well. Sure. Uh, it just, for me, wasn't something that I thought I would be interested in. Um, when Bob Dickinson came to Carnegie, he came with Noah Mitz and they did like a little television workshop of sorts, kind of introduced to me this concept of television lighting being theatrically driven. And that was something that I had no idea could exist. And they were like, come check out some shows. We did a, like I interned with them on a couple projects and it, it really pushed me in a direction of, oh, the things that I love about theater and creating these looks and creating these moods also exist in television, but at a much faster pace, which it, for the way that my brain functions was like the totally right thing to do. Bunch of projects under your belt. We're gonna talk about just a couple of them. I, I see you've carefully selected two projects that you also work on there, Chris. <laughs> I'm not dumb. Just look it. <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about Boston. Can you yeah. walk us through some of that, that plot? So the show's about 250 plus or minus some moving lights and then another 280 conventionals on top of that. Um, it has stayed relatively consistent since the first year that we did it. I mean, there, there's a lot of, again, historical things of it, it is what it is. Um, I, I've made a lot of changes to LED since that first year and even to some IP rated stuff. Although the, the financial implications of conventional versus LED are just not quite there yet. So we're, we're still, still rocking a big old bank of park hands. <laughs> I know them. I know them well. Yes. Uh, so all the lights under under Ryan Tanker's control. How is uh, or how do you divvy up that system? So we we bring with us on this show a pretty spectacular team, and I'm not just talking you up because you're here. Um, I can know. But we there is a there's a single MA two system. Uh, it has in the past been a EO system. It's been an MA system. We've used a variety of different types of previs. We do have, um, previs is kind of a loose term on the show. There's no time code or anything, so we're not really getting to build a lot of the music stuff. But because it is daytime and the rig is not up and we then don't want to, we don't have the ability to work a, a second overnight shift, the programming team and I sit in the basement of the, the venue and kind of work in this offline world where we're trying to build some focuses, trying to just get some structure into the show so that when we hit rehearsal, uh, it's ready. But this year we were supported on the consoles by uh, Ryan Tanker and Aaron Anderson. So one, one session, two desks. And we had a remote this year, which was new, and that was also on an MA2, and that was a gentleman named Jason Giaffo. I believe you're pretty familiar with that remote uh, process. No, that one too. Chris got sent very far away. <laughs> for a remote this year. Yeah, I sat across town. It was, uh, it was good, it was fine. And Jason was great. Can you tell us a bit about show day? So uh, there are a lot of things coordinated. You've got people all over the city waiting to watch these fireworks. You're broadcasting live. So um, with all of those trains coming into and leaving the depot, how, uh, how does that look? And the flyover, there is a flyover. Th this past year, 2019, was the first year that we changed the schedule. So back in 18, the only rehearsal time we ever really had was the morning of the third. We would rehearse with the orchestra and talent in the morning and then do what we refer to as a dress rehearsal that evening, 
but for the public. Like people can show up and watch it and we do everything except the fireworks. And that was really our first time ever seeing it on camera. Um, this past year, we added the third, or I'm sorry, the second as an evening rehearsal. So the orchestra came in the evening of the second, we'd rehearse with them, we did some notes after. They would not come in the morning of the third. They would come in just that evening, we'd do the dress rehearsal, and then the same thing on the fourth. The What that means for us, typically, is that the evening of the third winds up going until sunrise on the fourth. So the we'll we'll cut down to a very small programming crew and stay there till five or six a.m. basically until there is too much light to continue to work, uh, and then we'll walk back to the hotel and pass all of the people who are lined up to come and get their spot. Uh, we'll go back and sleep for four or five hours and then show up around noon, one o'clock, somewhere in that realm, to do a tech run through, where we just kind of step through all the beats and then eventually the show that evening. Coming up in part two, Mike talks about his involvement in Disney's Encore and America's Got Talent. Don't forget to like and subscribe.